Uh, here's just an introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Rui Apirahama. Uh, I come from a place called Ratanapa. I am uh, not an authority on Rastafarianism. I am born a Ratana. And uh, I come from Ngati Kuri Taupauri, Pohutiare, of the Northern Tribes and the Central Tribes. This is mm, when I used to be in south side of Bombay. And uh, this is my introduction to my love of music and the love of reggae. <coughs> and I'll touch on the, I'm talking about what's the time Mr. Wolf and there's a lot of analogies and a lot of colloquialisms in them. It's the time. What's the time? And this song is based on a prophecy of the leader of our church and movement, of the Rata and the church and movement, which I'll touch on. I'm here to talk about prophecy and the relevance, the relationship between us as Ratana and Rastafarianism around the world. And like a lot of roots reggae, conscious reggae, there's a lot of metaphors and a lot of images and imagery used, which is not too far from our experience. Mr. Daddy Longlegs crawling up to the ceiling Has anyone seen the world in the state it's in that's never been this way before? Has anyone who's got the eyes of love in another way? Has anyone who's got the story? 1981 was a powerful time for us Bastion point Reawakening of ourselves to ourselves What's the time Mr. Wolf? I'm asking our country and our nation is a beautiful country and I live in hope. What's the time? Is it our time? What's the time? And that's the, thought, that's the message that Bob brought to us. Why do we love Bob so much? For me, Bob came as an angel at a time where we needed role models. At a time where it wasn't cool to be Māori. It wasn't cool to speak our language. It wasn't cool to be ourselves. But the rise of Bob Marley, somebody who looked Maori, somebody who looked different, looked like our cousins down the road, somebody who made it to be popular, to be brown. And I say thank you to Bob Marley and this song and many others we wrote to say thank you to Bob for putting up a mirror to us and helping us see ourselves in ourselves. While we might appreciate all of the popular culture that Bob Marley, Rastafari brought to us, in the core and the depth of Rastafarianism is I and I. I and I. And uh, I had the privilege of going to Jamaica on a journey of reconnecting from Ratanism to Rastafarianism. And it's just a little bit of the trip to Jamaica. I can't show you the whole thing, but it just gives a little touch of when I went to Jamaica and you hear the island culture, the same smells that I smelled there in Jamaica were similar to the smells in the islands. The fruits, the food that were there were similar to here. The community culture there was similar to the community culture here. The poverty that I saw there and the oppression, there were lots of things that I could see here. But most of all what I saw is even out of a rubbish stump you can still grow a rose. And what I saw in even the face of adversity and all the ugliness of humanity, you can still grow a rose. And it is the power that I can't look past with Rastafarianism and overlook the likes of Marcus Messiah Garvey, a powerful man, a man who looked into his heart and reawoken the spirit inside of those who were enslaved through slavery and through each generation and gave a spark of hope. <coughs> if there's anything that I can sum up Rastafarianism for me, as I said, I'm not an authority on Rastafarianism, but if there's anything that I could sum up Rastafarianism is in one word, one love. 
by their organisations all around the world. One of the most uh, appealing things of Rastafarianism to me was you didn't have to become part of a church or a hierarchy to embrace the philosophy of one love, one heart, one destiny. One God, one name, one destiny. I was brought up as Ratana. One God, one faith, one baptism. Already that analogy. One God, one faith, one baptism. One name, one God, one destiny. I could relate to that as a Ratana. And that's me running around in Jamaica enjoying that wonderful Montego Beach <laughs> and driving through as you can see the images. Not too far from if you go to the far north, if you've ever been up to Hapu or Te Kao, it's no different to what you see here. You go up to the east coast where Lahiwi comes from, you can see third world conditions. Not very many people realise that even in New Zealand, in those isolated places where the tribes live, are growing up in a third world condition. And this is us travelling up to St. Ma, uh, my mile, St. Nance, to go and visit Bob's birthplace. And uh, there were places there that I heard in the influence of the Bible and Christianity in Jamaica is powerful. Just in one block alone, when I was staying in Ligony, just walk out in one block, there were 14 churches just in one block. And I was told that Jamaica per capita has the highest number of churches in religion. And when I walked out of Ligony, walked down the road, sure enough, 14 churches down one block. <laughs> that tells me about the Jamaican psyche and what Jamaica went through under slavery and how spirituality became a powerful link. This guy is a character. <laughs> He's funny ass and you want to hear his laughs. <laughs> And for me, reggae Rastafari, for me, all Ratanism is not about intellectual and trying to break down what it is, but how it makes you feel. As simply as how it makes you feel. So it was honour to go there and I met with Bob's daughter Stephanie and also with the other daughter Sidella and briefly with Ziggy. And uh, having met them and I want to mihi to my mātāmu and my tuakana and my kaumātua, to both Miriamma and Tingi. And also to Dennis at the back there. Knowing that all of the hard yards that you guys have done to introduce reggae into this country. While we might see the negative side of it, I can see the positive side. I want to say thank you to both of you for having the courage at a time where everything was new to bring about a new way of thinking for our people. This is me talking to Stephanie, the daughter, inside Bob's house, handing over a waka huia. And uh, as one of my ways of saying thank you to Bob and Rastafari and the impact in this country, I translated two albums of Bob Marley's songs into Māori. And uh, just quickly, as uh, Ngāhiwi uh, mentioned about the mouth, the melding of Rastafarianism, Reggae, Māori, Tikana, Kaupapa. I'm Ratana and I grew up with the Bible and the treaty as a foundation of our faith and movement. And when I first heard Bob Marley, the album Rastaman Vibration, I heard the powerful message of Haile Selassie. Until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior. That until the ignoble and the unhappy regime that holds our brothers in Angola, in Mozambique, in South Africa, in subhuman bondage, shall be toppled and totally destroyed. War. That until the colour of a man's skin is of no more significance than the colour of his eyes. War. That until that day, the dream of lasting peace, of world citizenship, a rule of international morality. Those who are familiar with that powerful message by Haile Selassie. I want to talk about Ratana and Rastafarianism. And talking about Ratana and Rastafarianism, I can't go past these three words. Colonization, Constitution and Christianity. The Holy Bible is a double-edged sword to our people. It is a sort of pain and suffering and a sort of liberation. And for our people who have seen 
the dichotomy or, or of the Bible and even the contradictions in it have put our people into a turmoil and into a spiritual turmoil which causes a deep, deep spiritual, cultural identity crisis. And we've been going through colonization and trying to heal that which the spirit has been disturbed. Politic politicians, money, economics cannot heal the sickness of the spirit. So it doesn't matter how much money we throw into the system, how much policies we drive, if we don't attack and we don't deal with the spirit of humanity, human spirit will always be sick. Again, I'm no authority, neither do I make myself out to be a guru. And if you're wondering why my voice is just slowly starting to get louder, it's because I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so it just helps me get the words out. But colonization, constitution and Christianity is important in relationship to Ratanism and Rastafarianism. We all know the history all up throughout the whole world of colonization. Colonization to me is not about against white man, against the black man. Colonization to me is about the dance between the powerful and the powerless. The dance between those who exploit and those who are exploited. I don't see color there. I see power. And for me, the difference between the dance between power and charm. I don't want power. I want charm. The world seeks after power. Politicians, religions, churches seek out the power. But for me, my children, and you and I, charm. I put this up because our history in 1814, Oihi the Christian heritage began in the north. At the same time, for the Ethiopians and in Africa, they were going through colonization. And as we know today, with the Americans going into the Middle East, it was all about what's underneath the ground. It's all about those diamonds, all the gold, the oil, etc. So colonization is about power and greed and who controls. Or he pefairangi Christianity came here. Our people in the north took to Christianity like ducks to water. Why? Because our people were followers of prophecy. Even before the advent of Christianity, we had prophets rising from the 1700s, the 1600s, the 1500s and the 1400s going back to our tohumas, Ngātoroirangi, Tamate Kapua, Katoa, Te Raka. All of the head tohumas who came on the waka vessels also gave prophecy of the time. One example is Toiroa from the East Coast in the 1700s and 1790s, Tifa Tifa Te Pō, Haruru Te Pō. Kei tua o te awe māpara, he kiri kōtea. Beyond the tattooed veil, beyond the tattooed face, there is a man with pure white skin. And he's not talking about Pākehā. And his God shall become our God, and his potato will become our potato. Now these are prophecies of the 1700s, foretelling the advent of Christianity coming to this country. Just so that thing he talked about, those in Nui. And with the advent of Christianity came a whole way of measuring our lives looking at our lives, and that the Bible became the new yardstick at measuring what's to be acceptable and what's not to be acceptable.